My name is Sila Hu, and I'm a professor at EPFL in Switzerland. Today, I would like to give you a lecture entitled Cooperative uh, Catalysis for Water Splitting and CO2 Electro Reduction. This lecture is on the occasion of me receiving the International Catalysis Award on the 7th International Congress of Catalysis. And now I would like to show you the presentation. So in heterogeneous catalysis, the active site model is well recognized and well used. And typically people think in the big uh, catalyst assembly, there are only a small portion of atoms that are responsible for the activity. And these are the so-called active sites and they, they normally are, are loaded on support and reactions take place on this size. It's fair to say that uh, the nature of these active sites as well as how reactions uh, take place uh, at this reaction size, uh, they are a central uh, thing of research in catalysis. Uh, but until now, uh, in heterogeneous catalysis, including electrocatalysis, uh, the active site, uh, uh, the details uh, would still be uh, difficult to understand. And for this, we can actually compare to a, a similar, uh, well, let's say, a field, which is homogeneous catalysis. Now, uh, it's fair to say that in homogeneous catalysis, uh, people uh, understand a lot more about the active sites. These are typically uh, single site uh, catalysts, and uh, uh, typically they are made of uh, metal ligand compresses. Now, uh, traditionally, it's uh, thought that reaction uh, take place at the metal size exclusively, and ligands, they serve to tune the electronic and sturdy property of the metal centers. Uh, in recent years, the metal ligand cooperation model is more and more recognized uh, in homogeneous catalysis, where the ligands are no longer spectators, they can uh, directly be involved in bomb making and bomb breaking events. This metal ligand cooperation uh, model uh, is not only uh, fundamentally interesting, but also opens up a new ways of uh, catalyst design and uh, tuning. In this talk, I would like to show you that in heterogeneous electrocatalysis, one can also have cooperative catalysis with more than one components, and that can give you a very really interesting reactivity. I will show you two examples of our research in this area. One of them is for oxygen evolution. The oxygen evolution reaction, which is uh, shown here in the blue part, uh, is the oxidative half reaction of water splitting, which can be used to make hydrogen using electricity for renewable energies. As such, water splitting is uh, widely uh, considered as a promising solution for future energy storage. Now, in the water splitting, uh, both the reductive uh, hydrogen evolution reaction and oxidative oxygen evolution reaction, they require a so-called over potential to basically take place in a reasonable reaction rate. Uh, but uh, in comparison, the OER has uh, a much higher uh, over potential loss, uh, even using uh, state-of-the-art uh, catalyst materials. In addition, uh, the choice of conditions and uh, materials are more limited for oxygen evolution. So uh, people often consider the OER as the so-called bottleneck for water splitting. If we look at the mechanism of OER, we may understand why this reaction is challenging. So here we take M, a metal-based catalyst, but just use M as the active site model. Uh, to make oxygen evolution, one has to go through four consecutive proton and electron uh, transfer. And so that, that means it's difficult to tune all of them at the same time to get an optimal performance. Now, if we start from this active site, you go through first 
uh, proton couple electron transfer, so uh, hydroxide uh, coming in, uh, electron going out, you make a hydroxy radical intermediate, which will undergo a second proton couple electron transfer to make an oxy radical on the surface. From here, two other oxy radicals can certainly combine to make O2 and regenerate the catalyst. And for, for some species, for some catalysts, this may well be the case, but it has been suggested that for the majority of uh, systems, actually the hydroxy attack, so hydroxy attack to the metal oxo species, coupled with electron transfer to make hydroperoxy species on the surface uh, is the, the main pathway. And from here, you do another uh, elect proton coupled electron transfer, you make oxygen and regenerate a catalyst. For this four step reaction involving three intermediates, ideally you want each step to be as close to the thermal uh, energy requirement. Mm -hmm. That would suggest that you want each step to have an energy difference of 1.23 eV. This is ideal, but not practical because uh, it has been shown that uh, various uh, absorbed species, uh, this is not unique for oxygen evolution, but for many heterogeneous reactions, uh, the energy, uh, they have a so-called scaling relationship. Uh, for instance, in this case, the absorption energy of hydroperoxy and hydroxy species apparently are having from all metal oxides has a computational uh, difference of 3.2 eV. And that is not the 2.46 eV if you uh, follow the ideal thermal cycle. And that gives rise to so-called uh, minimal uh, over potential. And so because of this scaling relationship, we can now use the so-called uh, energy difference of oxy radical to hydroxy radical. So the first step, uh, the intermediate step to, to get to this uh, thing uh, as the so-called descriptor. So this is X axis and Y axis is a theoretical thermodynamic uh, over potential. Uh, and so the best one can do, because the difference is always 3.2 eV, the best one can do is to have the energy difference of 1.6 eV. So each step take 1.6 eV, and that will give rise to an over potential about 0.35 eV. That's the best one can do. If you have uh, easier uh, to make uh, oxy uh, absorption intermediate or difficult to make, you learn uh, increase uh, the energy of one of these steps and give rise to a higher thermodynamic or potential. The same uh, kind of volcano uh, pot can be made also for uh, various metal oxides where you have a lot of, uh, let's say, mainly based on earth abundant elements, so things we like to use, uh, manganese oxide, iron oxide, nickel oxide, and indeed some of them actually uh, the formation of metal oxy uh, radical is too easy, so uh, the hydro C attack is too difficult, that become very determining. Uh, some of them, uh, the formation of uh, high metal oxy species is too difficult, so that give a lot of our potential. And on the top of this volcano plot is a so-called nickel iron oxide. If you assume iron as the active site, and calculation suggests this will have you know, a 1.6 eV, and so you have a minimal over potential about 0.35 eV. And let's suggest that this catalyst actually will be the best catalyst one can have for OER. Indeed, if we look at literature reports, we look at, so here is various uh, inorganic catalysts that have been reported. Uh, you can use all kinds of parameters. And here we use this uh, very simple uh, parameter over potential at 10 milliamp per square centimeter. The nickel iron based oxides are always the best performing one. Uh, regardless of the parameters one use. And so this is uh, consistent with the theoretical considerations and also a lot of studies have now shown the structure of nickel iron oxy hydroxide. So it's uh, thought that this structure is basic, based on uh, gamma nickel OH and with iron doping in the lattice, so iron replacing nickel, and they have kind of layer structure uh, in each layer, if you look at the top view, is this uh, this species will actually have octahedral 
coordination and these octahedrons are actually etching between one another to make an extended network. So this is the structure of the best uh, oxygen evolution catalyst. How do we make a catalyst that is even better? That's a difficult question, obviously. Uh, we we will not be able to answer that question easily. Uh, we were uh, a few years back, we were just uh, thinking that if this is the best catalyst, we just want to make a high surface area catalyst. So we decided to put them on nickel form. And we know that if you put nickel form in hydroxy solution, you oxidize it, you will probably make a layer of nickel hydroxide and under high potentials, they will turn into gamma nickel OH. We also know for literature, like if you have iron ions in a solution, they will be incorporated, doped into a structure. So we decide to take this to, to, to basically develop a method that is uh, uh, useful for making high surface area nickel ion oxyhydroxide or nickel form. And then we tested its uh, activity and we were surprised. Uh, here are some of the so-called linear web or thermogram of uh, some of these catalysts. We obviously uh, develop a different method, so these are different names of this, and you don't have to worry about it. You can read the paper uh, to know the details, but we, we, we do different uh, iterations and we can find uh, the best catalyst. And the activity is really uh, good because uh, even 200 millivolt potential, we have substantial activity, but you can see that these color goals are really high. And in fact, if we do a serious comparison, we realize that these catalysts are, are actually more active than we thought it would be. Uh, here, you know, these are the labels and we can put them into different electrodes because it's important to compare catalysts sometimes on the same support. So, so we can do that. We can use different parameters. We can use so-called tonal frequencies. And here we, we, we think Ion is an active site, so we use this. That's a matter of debate. So we can also use other parameters such as uh, the uh, specific activity. So this is the current density divided by electrochemical surface area. We can also use the over potential for a given current density, which I will show you in the next slide. And so we find that consistently we can make the best nickel ion oxygen hydroxide catalyst. Uh, our turnover frequencies and specific activity are typically five to 10 times higher than this nickel ion oxy hydroxide. And if you really want to feel good, you can compare to iridium oxide because it's actually not so good a catalyst. So we get hundreds of times higher activity in the lab. As I said, we can compare them directly by over potential. So we look at our thermogram, and this is the classic nickel ion hydroxy catalyst, and this is our catalyst. We, we're really much more active. So we are much more active, and we thought maybe they are not the same catalyst. And so for that, we actually decide to characterize this better. We use various techniques including especially X-ray absorption spectroscopy. We can look at the edge energies. We can look at the x depth to look at the fine structures and we quickly realize, we are our collaborators here, we realize that for the ion part, the ion oxy hydroxide cluster, it contains only octahedral based uh, structures. And so that, that is useful. So it will be similar to gamma ion OH. We can also look at the, 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 the data under operandal condition in operation and look at both iron and nickel edges. And we realize that this is not iron doped nickel OH. This is actually a two component catalyst where we have an iron oxide cluster uh, that is attached to a gamma nickel OH. Initially, they actually kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, facing. Mm -hmm. But under operation, operational condition in high potentials, you tune to a so-called uh, corner chain. And this process is actually reversible. And uh, so, so this will be a two component catalyst. And uh, we realize that such a structure may enable something that is uh, mechanistically different. So if we consider iron as the active site, we can make iron oxo species, so that, that's fine by computation. Then the hydroxy attack on iron to make iron OH is actually now having a very really high energy, 1.7 EV. And so 
list will be the potential determined step and so ion will not be a good catalyst. But if we now have a two component where we have a nickel OH nearby as a second component, we realize that when the hydroxy is immediately transferred to a side on nickel, this is a nickel side, nickel C, where the oxygen now is a good hydrogen atom uh, acceptor. So you take hydrogen, then we can actually uh, lower the energy pathway and we can see this uh, more, uh, more easily from this equation. So we have iron oxo species hydroxy attack. This is difficult, but if hydrogen is simultaneously removed to a hydrogen atom acceptor to make a nickel two hydroxy, then we don't have to form iron OH. So we get a low energy species and through internal electron transfer, we can release O2, regenerate the iron active site and have a nickel two site. Okay, now the last step would be to regenerate the nickel two site into nickel three and let's calculate to have a 1.3 EV. So overall, the whole energy barrier is lowered. And uh, to, to summarize that, that is, we start with iron species. So we make iron hydroxy, iron oxo, we know that the direct pathway to make oxygen is, is difficult because the hydroperoxy is too high in energy, but this hydrogen is simultaneously moved to the oxygen radical. Well, on the nickel C side, you make a hydroxy uh, nickel two species and you release O2. And this one has an energy of 1.3 EV. And the final step to regenerate the catalyst is 1.3 EV. So all, all the highest number is 1.3 EV. So we completely lower the energy uh, pathway. And so, so the theoretical potential is not only 0.1 and that can expand why this catalyst is more active. And so uh, in that sense, we now have all a kind of traditional volcano plot by having a three component system where the ion hydro OH, OH uh, is e easy to get so the oxo species, but it does not have to go through a direct uh, hydroxyl uh, with oxygen, which is difficult. Instead, it has a hydrogen atom acceptor to help it to go less, so the energy uh, is lower. Now, uh, the third component on this volcano is the regeneration of hydrogen atom acceptor uh, to come back, and this has an energy of 1.3 EV. And so the lower potential is about 0.1. And so uh, with that, we can actually have the so-called new volcano plot when you have a so-called cooperative catalysis where you actually overcome the uh, limitation of the previous volcano plot by having the so-called bifunctional catalysis. And so we think this cooperative uh, two-component catalysis uh, is really uh, can be uh, useful to overcome the limitation. Now I would like to show you another example of cooperative electrocatalysis uh, for CO2 electro reduction. Many of you know that you know, CO2 electro reduction is attractive. You can make various uh, products, hydrogen, CO, or methane, or you can make liquids like formate or um, uh, methanol and so on. And uh, now out of all these possible products, many, many uh, people have different uh, choices, but CO, I, we think it's interesting because it's part of syngas and syngas can be used to make many other products in, in petroleum industry. And so uh, we were interested in this process. And one thing of course is important is the selectivity. And for mm -hmm. CO2 reduction to CO, so far the most selective catalysts are so uh, precious metal like silver or gold uh, and silver species. In recent years, the metal NC catalysts, typically these are metal ions that stabilize on the surface, either with carbon support or nitrogen dope carbon support. And uh, they have been shown to be very selective uh, for CO2 to make CO. So that's very nice. Uh, the disadvantage is that they typically require high over potential and the current densities are not so high. Uh, so because our lab, were, we were doing some single atom catalysts of this type, we decided to also study them for CO2 reduction. They wanted to test uh, iron systems. Uh, we make our iron NC uh, compound by uh, pyrolysis of uh, porous uh, material zinc, GIF-A, 
with ion doping, a high temperature and the zinc will be evaporated, so we end up with just ion NC compound. Now, uh, we, we characterize these compounds and we found that indeed these are atomically dispersed, so you can look at it by very, various different ways. So this is aberration uh, corrected TM image, we can do see a single atom species. So that, that is consistent with, with this field. We then characterize them by uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. We can look at the edge energies and we can look at the uh, oxidation states. We can also look at the structures. So we know uh, it's uh, iron-3 to start with. It has about three nitrogen and one carbon. So that is similar to many of such species in the literature, except that uh, for iron compounds, typically they have iron-2. We check the CO2 performance, so we use our ion-3 NC compound. We make the ion-2 NC compound uh, from literature as a reference. We also uh, make uh, both the three electrode setting, also a gas diffusion electrode setting. And so this is ion-3 uh, NC compounds. And so we were uh, quickly uh, happy to see that uh, uh, these catalysts are really selective for CO2 reduction to CO with more than 80% for the efficiency easily. Uh, the other side product is basically hydrogen and they are much more selective compared to the literature and two base catalyst. We look at the partial uh, CO uh, current densities uh, and so if we look at the same conditions, the red curve is our ion NC compound and the black curve is the literature report, the ion compound we are certainly one order of magnitude more active. In fact, CO2 reduction to make CO starts at uh, over potential about uh, 80 millivolts, so really low. Uh, if we use uh, gas diffusion electrode, we can get higher current density. So you can see this uh, respectful uh, current density at relatively still over, low over potentials. We can actually compare them to other catalysts. So compared to other single atom catalysts, we are much more active. So this is with three electrode setting. And they are actually really uh, in the same range of uh, precious metal or gold and silver. And uh, if we use GDE, we can see this current density really uh, uh, at the high end of literature reports. We can characterize them by uh, in situ X-ray absorption spectroscopy, we can look at the oxidation states and so on uh, under different potentials. And to our surprise, so without getting in, into the detail of this data, a lot of busy uh, lines, uh, we, we found that our iron-3 catalyst remain at iron-3 at potential as negative as minus 0.5. And so, so that's a big surprise to us because we thought under CO2 reduction, it's reductive potential, it will be reduced to iron-2. So these are quite stable. On the country, if we use iron-2 catalysts, we found that the catalysts actually decompose very quickly under reductive potentials. And so, so less uh, unusual. Uh, and we think that the region, uh, the fact that we have iron-3 sites actually can explain why these catalysts are so active. And so uh, through mechanistic study, including electrokinetic, we know that the first step of this reaction is a proton decoupled electron transfer. So you make basically a CO2 radical absorb on the iron site. Then you have a protonation to make a formula species. Then you have a proton couple electron transfer to make water and you have a, a CO absorbs on the site. And then desorption of CO give you the catalyst and the product. Now, obviously, if you have iron-3 versus iron-2, for CO release, iron-3 is much better because it has low ability to make back, back bonding. And that's important because at high current density, CO release can be a, a redetermined step. And so we can get really high current densities. And that's why that can expand. In fact, we also find that even for the first step, the CO2 absorption, the iron-3 size is more advantageous than the iron-2 size. And that can expand why it's more active. Now, the real puzzle is, why do we have stable iron-3 sites and reductive potential? And this involves actually a new mode of cooperative catalysis. So uh, we know that for any compound, molecular compound dissolved in solution, you have a redox potential. Okay, so here is redox potential. If you take an electro, a metal electro, and you're trying to do a redox chemistry, now you can move this uh, Fermi level up by applying a negative bias, 
okay? And if it's more negative than the redox pattern, so electron transfer will take place, so your ion C will be reduced to ion 2, and that's what we expect. However, now we have, we think we have a really particular system of cooperative catalysis, where the ion sites are electronically conjugated to the nitrogen doped carbon. So in this case, this is a Fermi energy or the metallic structure, the ion C size is here, they are coupled. Now, if you move this energy level up, this one also will move up because they are electronically coupled, so that you never have a situation where this will be more negative into electron transfer. And so in this case, you have a stabilized ion C sites, and that actually result in this very unusual activity. And this is certainly due to the cooperative catalysis, if you want, of this ion C site and the nitrogen doped carbon support. And so we think that is a case where electronic coupling of the ion sites with the support completely alter the redox property of the sites, stabilizing ion C, and that give you higher catalytic performance. So with this, I hope I will convince you that cooperative catalysis in heterogeneous electrocatalysis uh, not only mechanistically uh, interesting, but also uh, provides new uh, opportunities for catalyst development. And with this, I would like to thank the people who have done the work. So the oxygen evolution part is done by Dr. Fan Sung. Uh, the CO2 reduction is done by Dr. Jingu with contributions of Li Cheng, who originally developed a single atom species in our lab. Uh, for collaborations, uh, computations are done by the lab of Professor Commonberg. Uh, XAS are done initially in, with Soleil, with uh, Benjamin Lasso, and finally with uh, Professor Sheng Haoming in Taiwan, where we have now extensive collaboration, funding from different uh, sources. And with this, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. Finally, I would like to say that uh, uh, it's a pity, of course, the Congress cannot take place, uh, but uh, I hope uh, you find my presentation uh, interesting. And if you have any feedback or comments, feel free to uh, send me an email.